All right, so I'm Erica Vervo, and I help Nomadic Matt run his community arm. So for those of you who don't know me, I've been working with him for whew, many years, like seven years. And uh, in the beginning of, or at the end of last year, we started this whole nomadic network. And the idea was that we would gather people in all different cities all around the world and have them meet their people which is super exciting. We had a really fun time. We launched 22 different cities in a matter of months. And, um, and then the coronavirus hit and you know, you know what happened. No in-person gatherings whatsoever. So we had to switch to virtual events and that's what these are. And it's really great because, you know, Danielle can be in a log cabin in Vermont talking to somebody in the Chrysler building and it all works out and we can really bring you some amazing talks by amazing experts in the industry and we're so excited. Um, just a few things to keep in mind for this. Uh, you can turn your camera on, it's actually super nice and since this is like a community effort we really like to have the camera on so we could see people's faces um you will be muted and there will be a q a at the end of the presentation so feel free to use the chat uh, to connect ask questions share any personal experiences so if people are asking questions and you can answer it feel free to answer you know this is a this is a community um so um just feel free to interact we're not just robots like watching a TV screen. It's a Zoom call. And so uh, also, if you could start your questions for Danielle with the word questions, that would be super helpful on my end. Um, the replays for this will be available to any of our Patreon members. So that's really fun. It's our little community, our other community that is like an exclusive community that gets extras and this these are some of the extras like these TNN presentations. I know a lot of you ask if replays are available. They're available on Patreon. Um, and then we are here to learn, satiate our wanderlust since most of us are sitting at home right now for the fifth month <laughs> and have fun. And also, I just wanted to remind you that each and every one of our speakers does this out of the kindness of their heart. We are not able to pay anyone. So these are just people that are speaking out of their passion and they just wanna share their knowledge with you and really reach our community because they know that our community is wonderful and just full of travel enthusiasts and great people. So we're very grateful for all of our speakers, especially Danielle today. Um, and also, Danielle is not using a, a presentation, so I just wanted to give you a visual of what she's about so you could find her at the thought card. I'm sure she'll be sharing that anyway, but um, she actually has a book coming out and you can pre order it on Amazon. That QR code is really handy. You just have to point your phone like at the, cam the camera part of your phone at it and it'll just bring up that link. So that's super easy. I will stop sharing my screen and let Danielle take it away. I am just so excited to have you, Danielle. Like I can't even explain. I'm very pumped because I feel like you have so much passion for just like really, affordable travel and finance. And I can't believe you have paid off so much debt in so little time. You own a house, you travel the world. I really am excited for you to talk to everyone at the Nomadic Network because these this is the kind of life that we sort of all want, right? Um, and so I'm very excited that you're here to talk to us and I'll let you take it from here. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for coming today. We're going to be talking so much about a lot of different things. Uh, but before we do, I just wanted to share with you that I'm in Vermont right now. We're traveling. It's about three hours from my regular home. Um, and if my internet craps out, just bear with me. I will try to be back as soon as I can. So just to give you a little introduction about myself, my name is Danielle Desir. I am a financially savvy traveler. I am passionate about travel and money and I am the creator of The Thought Card. So if you want to head over to my blog, it's thoughtcard.com. I have also a podcast called The Thought Card, all the Thought Card brand. 
And I really focus on helping financially savvy travelers make more informed financial decisions. Again, if you're able to think smart about how you make and spend money, you'll be able to do so much more in a short amount of time. And the three things I focus on is not only affording travel, so how do you save for travel, but also paying down debt and then building wealth. So high level accomplishments. I was able to pay down $63,000 of student loan debt in four years. I also bought a house at 27. I live in Connecticut. Um, so I'm about three years into my mortgage and I paid down $20,000 of my mortgage so far, which is a lot. Um, I am on the path uh, to financial independence. So I wanna retire by 45. I'm about to be 30 this year. So I'm just pushing away. I see a lot of people nodding their heads like, yep, that sounds like something that they wanna do. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, uh, but I've learned a lot along the way. So that is high level who I am. If you wanna connect with me, feel free to connect with me at the Thought Card on social media. But for the first part of the session, we're gonna talk about traveling with a full-time job. So there's a big narrative out there that says that you must quit your job to travel the world, that you have to uh, be remote, like independent, lo location independent, to live a life of your dreams. And the truth is that not everyone wants to or can do that, right? Because I made a decision really early on in my 20s that I wanted to buy a house, I kind of have to be here and I have to make money to support that decision that I made for myself. Uh, but in the scheme of things, I also really do enjoy my job. I'm really good at what I do. I'm a research administrator and I, I love what I do. So for me, quitting my job and traveling the world is not necessarily something that I wanna do right now. Perhaps when I'm retired early by 45, maybe that's something I wanna do later. But for now, it's not. So with that being said, I really wanted to step back and highlight what folks like me, folks who travel um, part-time and folks who have full-time jobs, what is it like and the things that we do so that we can be able to travel more. So the first thing I wanna talk to you about is making sure you know what parameters that you have to live in. When you have a full-time job, there will be things like if you have to be in the office, there will be schedules set. So knowing what parameters important. These are the parameters we're talking about. So knowing how many vacation days you have and also knowing how many holidays you get a year. If you are based in the United States, there is no universal uh, law that tells folks, that tells companies that you have to uh, have X amount of vacation days. Every company has a different uh, policy and makeup. So if you're moving from one company to the next, you need to know what that is. And based off of your parameters, you can start making really wise decisions in terms of how you're gonna use those days. Now, one of the things that people say all the time to me is like, I only have 10 vacation days a year, and that doesn't seem like a whole lot. And the first thing I say to you is that you're living in a scarcity mindset that way, because 10 vacation days is what you know the, your uh, business is telling you, your employer is telling you, but you're not counting the weekends. There's 104 weekend days a year, okay? That means there's all these opportunities for you to explore local and, or go far. Okay, so I want you to start really taking a look at your weekend trips and also taking advantage of holidays as well. For me, when I'm looking at holidays, I'm looking at that as like free days. These are days that I'm getting that I don't have to ask anybody for, no permission, right? And that is primarily how I'm able to extend my trip is by using the holidays. And I'm gonna tell you a couple of them that I really, really like to uh, use in a minute. But before that, after you figured out, okay, how many vacation days, and even if you've been at your job for a really long time, I still encourage you to go back to your handbook and really take a look because there's a lot of like sneaky policies that companies have, like for example, lose it or use it or lose it. So that's something that I had to do this year. During COVID, I had something like a bunch of vacation days that I was gonna lose and it broke my heart that I can't travel internationally. So here I am in Vermont or I go around in Connecticut and explore, right? But that's a policy that I need to be aware of and it's all in my handbook. So even if you feel like you got this, Danielle, I know this already, still go back because there may be something that you may be missing. Secondly, uh, I also think about in terms of my role and responsibilities, when are the times that I can actually be out of the office? So right now I'm in Vermont because no one is looking for me. No one needs me right now. 
But in my job as a research administrator, I work on a very tight deadline and three times a year, I have to be in the office. And as a manager, that's an even higher level of responsibility as well. So not only do I have to number one, know how many vacation days I get a year, but I also have to know when are the optimal times that I can be away from the office because that again, starts closing the barrier, starts closing in. I can know, okay, there's three times a year that I can travel and I'm gonna start looking for different deals around that time. So knowing your land is very important and the reason why I'm stressing this is because when you move from job to job that's gonna change and you have to relearn what's gonna work for you at the end of the day so that's in terms of parameters now let's talk about weekend travel when it comes to weekend travel and I detail this in my book you have to think about how far are you willing to go on a weekend when I say weekend travel it's usually uh, Saturday and Sunday. And in the chat box, I would love to hear when you're going on a weekend trip, do you prefer to go Friday night or Saturday morning? Which of these? This is a huge debate in the travel sphere. Uh, or do you prefer to go on a weekend trip on Friday night or Saturday morning? So personally, I like to go Friday night because I want to wake up Saturday there. I want to feel fresh. I want to wake up downstairs and get my breakfast buffet and start the day, right? And I don't really care about arriving to a city late in the evening time. It doesn't really matter to me as long as I am refreshed the next day. And as a budget traveler, before I used to say Saturday morning, because again, I'm trying to cut costs. But when you have a full-time job, you have to really think about, is this worth me being exhausted and tired? You know, So that's why I decided to, on Friday evenings, I'm going to go and travel um, and arrive at my destination because, again, I want to be rested so that for Saturday, I'm all prepared. But some people even can do Thursday evenings, too, after work on Thursday. I see Dustin's like, yep, Thursday evening. Thursday evening is like a new thing for me because now I'm working remotely. Like, you can actually go Thursday evening and you arrive, for, you know, you know, when you're there on Friday, you could be working during the day on Friday, go to go out to lunch at a you know cafe or somewhere new in town. And then after work at five, boom, you're out exploring, uh, you know, after work. So there's a lot that you can do in a weekend trip. And when it comes to weekend trips, I try to do it at least once a quarter. So once every season, I try to at least go on something somewhere. And I love to go to cities, like to do a lot of fun, cool things. But what's important again for when you're planning a weekend trip is to figure out how far are you willing to go? And this is where trial and error comes. And throughout the book, I talk about this. All of these are just ideas and suggestions, but you have to put yourself out there and do everything. I've been to Norway in a weekend trip. I've been to, you know, I've been to Sweden on a weekend, literally two days I was in Sweden. The, the deal was so phenomenal, I could not pass it up, but it was amazing and I wouldn't pass it up if in the world. And the reason why I love weekend trips is because it's a little taste. It's a little tiny taste of what it's like to actually enjoy that city on a macro scale. And here's the thing, I, I, know, uh, I know that Nadine is here, in this, she's here somewhere and she lives in Atlanta and I personally don't like Atlanta. I don't wanna be there for two days. Okay, I don't, I really don't. So a weekend trip was a perfect amount for me to know, okay, is this worth me wanting to spend more days than, you know, than where I am right now? So I would say, if you're not really sure, uh, if you will like a destination, a weekend trip is a good introduction to it. And then you could determine if you want to spend more time there. So that is my recommendation uh, for weekend trips. Again, Chicago was one of my favorites. San Francisco is one of my favorites. And now during COVID, it's really just, uh, I try to do one thing a weekend. So I give myself like an hour drive. What can I do? A brewery, a cidery, a hike? a beach or something so one thing every weekend is enough for me to feel like wow i'm making i'm doing something fun um it doesn't necessarily need to always uh you know spend so much money as well okay so we touched a little bit on holidays but i want to stress holidays are free days most employers in the u.s will give you anywhere from eight to ten holidays a year some employers will give you floating holidays, which means that you can pick any day you want out of the year. So make sure that you're counting that in how many days you have throughout the year. What I decide to do every single year, I sit down and I look at all the holidays for the year and I map it out. And when I say holidays, the ones that my employer allows me to take. 
And then I sit down and I realistically start to cross off the ones I know that I'm most likely not going to travel during that time. Thanksgiving, my husband is like, nope, can't, can't leave me for Thanksgiving. So I already crossed that off. And no, I cannot travel for Thanksgiving. I usually don't travel for Christmas. And that again, allows you to see how many days realistically can you travel. Now, here's why I really love holidays. I love winter holidays particularly because in January for the US, you have Martin Luther King weekend. Phenomenal time to travel if you're looking at flight deals, okay? And how I usually do for that weekend, I usually take maybe, um, let's say I would leave work Wednesday night. Leave work Wednesday night. I take off Thursday and Friday, okay? So I take off two days. Saturday, Sunday, another two days. Monday, off holiday, I have a five day trip just right there by taking two days off in January, okay? And I've been to Ireland twice during that time. I go to Ireland, every year I try to go to Ireland during that time because that's a really good time to go to Ireland. But that is simple, simple, a very simple way that you can be on a five day trip by just taking two days off of work, which is very easy. The same exact strategy can be used for President's Day, which is in February. Now here's the caveat, President's Day falls usually very close to Valentine's Day weekend. So it's important for you when you're planning your trip for you to plan at least six to seven months ahead of time so that you can at least be able to save as much money as possible because again, Valentine's Day gets a little bit more expensive. But the same thing can be used there. You can take off Thursday and Friday or you could take off, let's say Friday and you still have a three day weekend or a four day weekend. So that is one of the two of the ways in the winter time that I usually travel. And in the summertime, I actually try not to travel as much because again, I'm in the East Coast and it's like so beautiful out. So I don't travel that much. But again, if you do want to take advantage of 4th of July, Labor Day, these are all fantastic times. And there's an amazing hack in thanks Thanksgiving. Actually, Thanksgiving is actually a really good time to travel as well because the flights are usually cheaper. But the hack for me that I really love is uh, Christmas and New Year's because it's two weeks it's two weeks away from each other. So you're getting two days back to back. So you could plan out 10 day trips easily by spending so many less days uh, because again, there's two weeks back to back and each week you have a day off. So these are things to think about. But again, it all comes down to sitting down and mapping which are the holidays do I want to take? And then you could have a very clear picture and you could again now start to travel, holiday travel, which I thought was really important is number one, negotiating to work remotely. Um, especially now during COVID, it is something that we can actually try to advocate for. So here's a fun fact that I found out um, in my research. So since the 1970s, there was a, a physicist in NASA who discovered, and he's a grandfather of remote working, and he wrote a, a paper about it since 1970s. So since the 1970s, remote work was a thing, and it's taken society so long, businesses so long to actually try to adapt this, okay? So for me, that's like, I, I felt like, nobody talked to me about this in business school, like this is like, why is this a thing? But for me, I'm all about when it comes to my job, planting seeds. So it actually took me two years, two and a half years for me to actually be able to successfully nego negotiate working remotely at work before COVID happened. So I've been working remotely two days a week, two years ago. Um, and it took me two years before that. So it's been a four year journey of sitting my boss down and saying, I want to do this. We have the capability to do this. And it was a no. When I got you know, great reviews, it was still a no. It was a no for so long but I did threaten to leave and then that it came back. So just in the book, you will hear a lot about my strategies in terms of uh, working remotely. But I think if you do think that you have a capability of working remotely, just plant the seed, just express your interests. Expressing that you want to or want to try is not a crime. And it took me way longer than I wanted for me to actually just say, hey, I'm interested in this. You don't have to say yes right now. But planting the seeds is really important. And that's what I want to say about remote working. Uh, my biggest thing for this section of this chat is for you to really be open to trial and error. 
a lot of people are going to say that you can't travel with a full-time job. It's really hard. It's really challenging. There's no time, money, all of that stuff. But it really, take, it really takes for you to be experimental. Like I said, I went to Sweden on a weekend trip. Okay, I know how far I'm willing to travel. And some of the trips were awesome. Some of the trips weren't that great. But now I know my travel style, which is how I like to travel and how I can do it. Okay, so trial and error is very important. And also be flexible and know that if you ever change jobs and if your uh, career path changes or you change employers, you're going to have to figure this out again. But what's important is once you figure out your methodology, like I said, like knowing the parameters and all these other things, it's so easy to go from one job to another and still make it work. Okay. All right, so we're going to move now to the affording travel section. So as I mentioned before, my jam is talking all about saving for travel, making sure that travel is a lifestyle choice, not something that's nice to have or something that I do once in a while. Travel is a bill. So if you're not treating travel like a recurring bill right now, it has to be in your budget. And before we even talk about all of that, let's talk about budgeting. A lot of people think of budget as a bad word. Budgeting is not a bad word because it's really meant to be a guide. It's meant to, for me at least, I think of it as a Google Maps of my money. It helps me navigate bumps and speed bumps and help me project and I know turn right, turn left. So it's really a guiding tool. And when I don't have a budget, I'm a mess. When I do have a budget, for me, there's more structure in my life, which is very, very helpful. A lot of people think budgeting is restrictive, but who sets this budget? You do. So you're making your budget restrictive because that's what you want to do. You're the boss here. So I empower you to look at your budget as a tool that you could use to help guide you and guide your money. For me, money has very, a lot of like maybe four or five different roles. You can spend it, you can save it, you can donate it to charity, you can invest it. What is your money doing? Every single dollar that I earn has to have a job. Give your money a job and then your budget will let you know exactly which job and which like role it's going to play in your life. So that's very important. And once you're able to, okay, take the money block that, okay, budgeting is bad. It's a bad word. It's going to help me, you know, guide me. Here's how um, I think of budgeting. It's super simple, super simple. Income minus expenses equals zero. Everything that comes into your life and everything that goes out some way or, or some form is zero, okay? And guess what? Travel is built in there. It's one of those line items in there. And for me, that makes budgeting super simple because I know, again, everything has a job and travel is in there. It's absolutely in there. So if you're not treating travel like a bill, shift your mindset and give this a try because it will really change your life. Just like Netflix or going to the gym is important to you, if travel is really important to you, you're gonna start treating it as such. And another thing that I do that's really important is I also have a travel fund. It's a separate bank account devoted solely to my travel savings. It's not enough for me to say, oh, I wanna travel and okay, I'm gonna treat it like a bill, but it needs to actually go somewhere. And when you co-mingle your funds, it's really hard for you to, for you to feel like, okay, this is the money I have for travel if you can't see it on its own. When you have its own separate bank account, you could at a glance, go into your app and see exactly how much money you need for travel and you can make an informed decision. You can say, I have enough money to plan this trip to Costa Rica or to plan this weekend getaway to Vermont because you can see it. Now, another thing that I think is also important to do is automation. So I'm more of the philosophy of set it, forget it and watch it grow. So I just set this up once and it's happening in the background regardless. And the reason why automation is so important for me is because I think the more I touch stuff, I mess things up, it blows up. So I just set it, forget it, and it's growing in the background. Now, because I have a full-time job, what I do is my employer allows me to have funds directly deposited to as many bank accounts as I want to. So great. So I have a set amount of money carved out of my budget and it goes directly from my paycheck directly to my, my travel fund bank account. So I'm not involved at all. And every time I get paid, ka-ching, money in my travel fund being set, you know, sent away automatically. So I never have to think about saving for travel. I never have to like be worried. Or there's some people who also, when they're saving for a trip, they kind of like 
stop all things. Like they stop everything to say for this one. which again, makes it very hands-off. Um, and it makes it just easier for me. Like I said before, I prefer to very be hands-off in my finances and having this automation really helps a lot. All right, so we talked about budgeting being a roadmap, being a guide, Google Maps, really something that you set and you control. So really empowering you there. We talked about treating travel like a recurring bill. We talked about automation, making sure that your, if you, especially if you have a nine to five, or you know, a lot of us, a lot of us have a nine to five here. So making sure that direct deposit is set is so critical. One last thing about affording travel I want to share is that saving doesn't have to hurt. The philosophy that hundreds of dollars for me to feel like true. Every little bit counts, and here's why. In 2014, I had an idea. I wanted to go to Paris, and all I had to save was $25 a pay period, and I get paid every other week. And at the end of the year, I had enough to book flights to actually go to Paris off of $25 every pay period. That was all I could afford. And for me, that, that's a lot. That says a lot because you don't have to feel like if I'm not saving $100 every week, I'm not going to be able to save for travel. Okay. Start small, start where you're, start where you're at. And let's say you're one of those folks that's like, okay, I, I, I have a budget, but I'm not really sure. Like, how do I find the money in my budget for travel? So here are two tips I would share with you. Number one, when you have all your list of expenses for the month, make a, two columns, a wants versus a needs list. What are the things that I need to survive? What are the things that I want to survive? And I would look at the wants list and see if there's anything that you can cut out of that wants list. And again, make sure you capture it and put it away every single month so you're not just you know, making, you're know, wasting that funds. And then the second thing, what I was going to say, the second thing, I think I forgot the second thing I was going to say. Um, yeah, I think I forgot, Erica. <laughs> I'm on a roll here. If it comes back to me, though, I will, I, will, uh, I will think of it. But that, I mean, overall, these are my big tips. And this will really allow for travel to be a lifestyle choice. Like I said, travel is not nice to have. It's not something that I do when it's fun or on occasion. It's part of my life and it's something that I do all the time because it's built into my finances and the fabric of everything that I do when it comes to my money, okay? All right, last section is paying off student loan debt. Oh, yes, okay. So I had $63,000 of student loan debt when I graduated. Um, and 20 of that came from undergrad and 43 of that came from graduate school. Despite me having a bunch of scholarships, there we are. Now, I think when it comes down to like having large goals, like buying a house, paying down debt, it has to be something emotional has to drive you there. And everything financially that I do is driven by an emotion. Some emotions are bad. Like I'm like, the debt was a bad emotion. And I'm going to tell you why it was a bad emotion. Um, and it's funny because now that I'm working on paying off my mortgage, it's a good emotion. So debt doesn't always have to feel like a bad thing. Debt could be a good thing too, because my student loan felt bad. My mortgage feels good. It's weird, but still the, what's important is having that emotion to drive you. What's really important when you have student loan debt and you're really serious about paying it off is to sit down and know your numbers. Big theme that I have here, always knowing your numbers. The most important, important, important part of your debt is your interest, okay? So principal is how much you actually owed. You owe the, you, the lender. That's the original loan amount. And then the interest is their cut. And when it comes to student loans, you have to know how much interest you're paying per day, okay? Because what's going to happen is when they send you the bill, it's going to be all lumped together and you're not going to know. You're not going to know like the interest. But the interest is really what's keeping you away from actually chipping away at your student loans. There's tons of stories of people who, let's say, had $100,000 of debt. 10 years later, they still have $100,000 of debt. They made no movement, right? There's a lot of stories out there because their interest is continuously compiling. So one day I sat down and I calculated my interest. I was like, let's, for kicks and giggles, let's see how much I owe. So for you to do this for yourself, you're going to take your student loan bill and you're going to look at the interest portion of the bill. And you're gonna divide that by 30, okay? So there's 30 days in a year, or 30 days in a month, so you divide that by 30, and that's gonna give you your daily amount owed. 
And that becomes a number that you need to beat because you need to cover your, uh, your interest first so that you can start chipping away at your principal. My interest per day was $10 and 10 cents a day. Okay. For me, I had no job. I wasn't even earning $10 a day. So I didn't even know what I was doing. Uh, but I got really angry. I felt swindled. I felt like no one told me, like no one talked to me about this and how to get out of this debt. So I used that anger and that emotion of anger to get me out of debt. And I made a plan based off that anger. So I think emotion is really important when it comes to paying down debt, because if you're doing this debt payoff for someone else, you're not going to feel as motivated, but if it's intrinsic in you, you're going to feel like, okay, I'm ready to take this on and I'm going to stick it, stick to it, even when it's hard. So once I figured out that I owe $10 and 10 cents, so instead of just paying $10 and 10 cents a day, I actually upped that. So I did like $15 a day, $20 a day because that's when you're gonna start actually hitting your principal, okay? So hope I'm not confusing here, but what you really wanna do is know how much interest, which is how much you need to, you know, just to pay off, you know, just to, to pay this lender, and then you need to beat that amount. So in the beginning, I was just starting like just $5 extra I could do a day, and I just actually put that, put that in, uh, but it really starts to snowball, and this is called the snowball method. One more thought for that. It's also important for debt, for you to know your debt style. I am a type of person, I thrive off quick wins and money involved as well. So I thrive off of get this goal, get this goal, beat this debt, do this, you know, little, little wins. So it didn't make sense for me to work on a $50,000 loan or, you know, some huge amount of loan. I worked on the small loans. I worked on the $500 loan, the $750, and I would just check off all the wins. And I was like, yes, yes, check, check. And I felt so happy and that kept me motivated. And that's how I pay off everything, including my mortgage, is I look at all the little wins I could have and that for me makes sense. There are people who are gonna be like, Danielle, well, that's kind of dumb because the interest, a lot of people wanna pay off the highest interest first. That's fine, but if it's not gonna serve you and make you motivated, then why are you doing something that someone told you to do? That's like, doesn't make sense. You need to focus on what makes you happy. And for me, Focusing on the small debts made a lot of sense, okay? So that's what I did. I coupled, I knew my baseline for my interest. I paid above and beyond that. And I looked at the small loans first because I knew those were the ones that were gonna make me feel really, really good. And that's how I kind of compiled my wins. So knowing your debt payoff style is very, very important. And even after all these like technicalities I talked to you about today and you're just like, okay, well, this sounds all good and, and dandy, but what do you want me to do right now? I would just say, pay more than the minimum payment. If anything you take out of this section of this talk is if you stick with the minimum payment, you're gonna go nowhere fast. It's designed to keep you stuck or keep you very little progress. So anything extra that you have, throw at it. Um, that is really key. And at the end of the day, I think for me, that's what really helped me is coupling all these things, knowing how much interest. And I would actually track, you know, track my interest. And over time, you will see it go down. It went from 10, 10 to 9, 10 to 8, 10. And I knew I was making progress when I saw that number go down, right? Um, and I also went above and beyond the minimum payment as much as possible. So, okay, I think those are all the three things that we talked about, like all things on my roster, Erica. <laughs> Wow. I feel very motivated right now. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's awesome. Get, yeah, get the money, do, do all your goals, get all your goals. I, I definitely like resonated with a lot of that. And a lot of it seemed like, oh, this is so smart and simple. And also, I don't know if I'll do it, but I will. Like now I feel very motivated. So I'm like, I have that good feeling that you're talking about. So I'm like, after yeah. this, let me look at my finances. Uh, <laughs> So you guys, if you have any questions for Danielle, I know we have a few, so I'll start off, but feel free to write question and just share them in the chat. Okay. Um, and so back to the full-time job bit, uh, we have a question from Emma uh, who's asking, how do you balance maxing out holiday allowance from your employer, like Christmas and New Year with budget travel? Because these periods are often like really expensive. Yes. So remember when I mentioned having a list of the ones that you want to go to? So for me, most of my holiday travel is in January and February. 
So that's, no one wants to travel during that time because it's cold. I live in uh, Connecticut, so super cold. So for me, it's not uh, a big challenge at all. It's easy to find cheap flights or it was easy to find cheap flights back then. So January, February was my time to travel. Uh, summertime is a little bit tricky because I would say if you're a budget traveler after May, it kind of gets a little expensive. It's a little hairy after May. So I just stick, I just really stick to uh, either more local road trips area or that's when I pull out the points and miles. So we didn't touch on points and miles today, but I see points and miles as a, a bridger of gaps, right? So I have my pocket of money for my, you know, my travels. And if I want to do a little extra, or if it's a little bit out of reach for me, that's where the points and miles can come in to bridge the gap. So for me, I, again, I prefer to do more winter travel because it's a lot cheaper when you live on the East Coast to do that. Summer times is more for me exploring uh, around here and out of budget, maybe having a little extra points and miles can help with that. And this is a great segue into our next talk, which is all about points and miles, a beginner's yes. guide with Nomadic Matt. That's happening Thursday at 12 p.m. EST. Mark your calendars. I'm literally like finishing the presentation now. It's going to be amazing. Matt is incredible when it comes to points and miles. And honestly, if you hear points and miles and you're like, that's something I wish I could do, but I can't come to this because it is honestly like what you need to do if you're a traveler, especially in America. I don't know if we have any non-Americans here, but America has so many opportunities to earn points and miles. So 12 p.m. EST on Thursday with Nomadic Matt. <sighs> Amazing. Um, okay, so then we have a question from Leah saying, how do you negotiate more vacation days when, or did you negotiate more vacation days when you started a job? And is that something you like typically suggest people do when they're transitioning their jobs? It is definitely something I would suggest doing. I did not know it at the time. I've been with my employer for about six, seven years now. So I didn't know what I didn't know back then. Uh, but it's definitely something that I would absolutely do because sometimes an employer can't match your compensation for your salary. You can say, well, kick in an extra five days and maybe you got a deal. And they might say, sure. Yep. Look, Eric is like, yep. <laughs> I literally did that with Nomadic Matt. I said, okay, if you know, if you can't like give me a promotion, I would just love to take some extra vacation days. I'm always traveling. That would be really nice. And he was like, sure. <laughs> Because honestly, they're going to pay you either way. So if you take a few extra days off, what does it hurt them? They're, it's not hurting their bottom line necessarily, unless they're giving you like three months off, which would be so nice. <laughs> yes. I would definitely recommend it though. I think when you're starting a new job, you are in a prime position to negotiate. So bring up all the things that you want um, and see what they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Then we also have a question from Justina who's asking, how often do you do this like weekend travel? Especially, I wanna say, I wanna add on to this, especially like international trips. Like how often do you actually do that? Yeah, we're not doing Sweden every other week. No, that's not it, that's not it. <laughs> um, I actually do, I would say three to four weekend trips a year. Okay. So that for me is a very, a uh, comfortable pace where it's not overwhelming because I still have responsibilities at home, but it still allows me to have that sense of adventure and, and, and feeds that wanderlust that I have. So three to four works for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then Tiffany has a follow-up question saying, how do you handle jet lag on a weekend trip, especially going back to work on a Monday? <laughs> I would, well, there's actually lots of apps now that can help with that. Uh, but I would say hydrate, stay away from coffee. And I try to, as much as possible, be home at a decent time on Sunday so I can at least have a little bit of rest. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a debate. Some people want to, you know, spend the entire Sunday at a destination and just kind of take a red eye flight. But for me, there was one time I, I flew to Oslo and my flight got delayed and I got back like, Monday at 3 p.m. My day was over at work. So I was like, okay, forget that. No more doing that anymore. Uh, so I would just say hydrate um, and really be, really be conscious because again, if your flight gets delayed or something happens, it's awkward having that conversation with your boss, right? Sometimes you're kind of just having, you know, just kind of laying low and having this all conversation with your boss could be weird. So just really be mindful of the time that you're coming back. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. 
I feel like also making sure you have nothing to do on Monday night. <laughs> like don't schedule anything Monday night and you'll be fine. Just go home yes. and sleep. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Agreed. Um, okay. So we have a question about, uh, budgeting your travels. So since everything is, since everything is automated, how do you decide when to book your trips? Is it like a chunk of money waiting for you just in case something happens? Or do you like, once you hit a certain number, like a thousand dollars, you like look for trips. So I used to be obsessed with cheap flights. So I would find a flight and boom, I would just book it if it felt right. Um, so I type traveler. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Can you just re-say that last Back? Okay, I'm good, okay. <laughs> Yes. No. Not. Oh my gosh. Um, so what I try to do is there's again, like I mentioned, there's always money going every pay period into this travel fund in the background. Now, when I'm booking a trip or I see something that's interesting, I look at it and I kind of compare it to my basic knowledge of the average price. And I call this a baseline. So I'm constantly looking at deals and looking at travel deals so that I can be informed on average, how much does it cost for me to go to X and X destination? So when I actually see a deal, deal, I can attest to see, have I seen this deal before? Is this really a deal or if this is like kind of fake deals? Uh, but when I look at a deal, I say, okay, this is a good deal. I'm ready to go with it. I usually look at my travel fund and say, okay, do I have enough money to cover this here? If I do, I usually book it. If I don't, well, there's gonna be another deal another time. Uh, so I really try not to like go above what I have, which is, I think is really important so that you could stay out of debt. So that is my personal travel style. Now, once the flight is booked, which that's where my trip starts at the booking the flight, then I start to look at, okay, what is it gonna budget for hotel? What's the food like? I really start to do more nitty gritty details and all the money that gets saved into my travel fund gets devoted to that trip. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would say is I actually, honestly, I have like 11 bank accounts. So I'm kind of like this bank account. I have all these bank accounts going on here. That's how I manage my money. Um, but I have two travel funds. So one travel fund is more of like this spontaneous, like when a deal comes up, it's kind of like all the time. But another travel fund I have is for like those dream trips. Like I want to go to Japan. And I don't want to just like have a find, like I might not find a deal for Japan, right? So I have a small little big account growing in the side uh, there for particular trips that I have in mind. Uh, but everything else is usually spontaneous. And I could usually put that in the like spontaneous travel fund that I have. That is the first I've ever heard of somebody having two travel funds. So congratulations. <laughs> that is I, like to I like to separate my money. I just like to, because there's a, a concept called envelope system. So there's people who right. walk with a bunch of envelopes yeah. and that's great. I just can't do it. So it's all virtual for me. All my accounts are all virtual. So it's all these little accounts for virtual. It's a virtual envelope system. That's how right. I, I think of it. I actually just did a trip like this with my now fiance, then boyfriend to Ghana. And we decided what our budget would be before then. And I t I've been traveling for like, I don't know, 12 years or something. And I've never decided a budget before I left. And honestly, we kept to the budget very easily. And I think it was just like a conscious, like an unconscious sort of thing that we were doing. We knew we had that much money. And I think we went like a hundred dollars over. And I was like, how? I've never even like, yeah. So uh, this budgeting stuff that you're talking about, this, this is very It could work. It could work. It could work. <laughs> um, okay. So also Doug is asking when it comes to budgeting your travel, since you're so vigilant about budgeting and numbers, what percentage of your annual gross and net income do you spend on travel related expenses? Not counting 2020. Mm, I would say, I don't look at my finances in that like macro view. To be honest, I look at it per pay period. Mm. How much cash do I have in my money right now when I get paid? Mm -hmm. And that's how I spend my money. I, I look at what I have and then I spend it based off of the budget I set. So I wouldn't be able to say like based off my annual, cause annual is like, it's like going to get your taxes done and you're like, wait, 
I made that much money. Where did it go? It doesn't, that's not really what matters is when you have the money in your hand, what you do with it. Right. So I'm more looking at what do I need to do this two weeks? Um, and based off that, I make decisions. Right. That makes sense. Um, and I feel like that's also just very easy for other people to do. It's like, look at this chunk of money and decide like how much is going to go out rather than this. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Eleanor is asking if you feel comfortable sharing, what are the savings accounts you prefer that are the homes to both of your travel funds? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's great. Uh, so I love, I'm American. Um, so I love Ally bank. So a L L Y.com. It's an online bank. And I like online banks because there's a couple of reasons. So number one, I can't just be like, oh, let me just go to the bank and pull out my ATM real quick. Like there's a bit of a hassle that goes with it. And when you're from your, let's say, and also for Ali, I've been begging with them for like something like six, seven years. I've called them only a handful of times. So just because they're online doesn't mean that it's going to be bad service. You may never even need to call them. And I've really, really never had to call Ali Bank, and I love their service. You can also name your bank accounts, which is fun. So I have a bank account, for Japan 2020, who knows when that's going to happen. So I have one, you know, one of my bank accounts is named that. Um, and you can open up with as little as $5. So it's easy to open, it's easy to maintain, and everything is on your phone. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, we have a question also asking, um, well, that was sort of the same question. So for paying off student debt, this is a question. So if you're, let's say, if you have $10 and 10 cents to pay off and you want to put in $15, do you have to send like two separate checks to make sure that you're paying off the principal and the interest or can you just send it all together and they'll put some of it in the principal? I think it depends on your lender. So that's very important for you to ask. If I send an extra payment, how can I deter, like how can I make sure it goes to the right place? Mm -hmm. And for me, back then it was a manual thing. So I would have to put a payment in and email them every time and say this $50 goes to this particular loan. So before you start going crazy and start tackling a whole bunch of your debt this way, make sure you call them and ask them, how can I apply my payments to make sure that this goes, a portion of it goes to principal. Because mm -hmm. if it's not going to principal, it's going to go towards your next payment, which mm -hmm. doesn't really help you. You no. really want it to go to the principal and you have to make sure it's, it's, uh, it's stated there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, we also have a question from Tana that says, how do you pay $15 a day if you weren't making any money or if you were, you weren't making even $10 a day, how do you work that out? I had to get a job. I had just graduated grad school and I had no job at the time. I had to get a job. Um, so that's what helped me. Once I got a job, I was able to map it out and make sacrifices to do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, we have a question from Tony asking, what travel rewards cards do you currently use? Oh, that's a good question. Where's my, uh, I have a bunch of them. I was like, where's my wallet? Um, my <laughs> favorites, my favorites would be, let's see, definitely Chase. Everyone says that the Chase preferred card um, is a favorite. I also like uh, my Delta Sky Miles card, my platinum card, because they give you, uh, they give you a free ticket every annual domestic free ticket flight, uh, which is really, really great. And I'm also Delta loyal. I really like Delta a lot. So it's super easy. What I would say, if you're into credit cards right now, a lot of these credit card companies, because they know that we're home, they're upping the actual miles per dollar spend on several different types of categories, like groceries, mm -hmm. like, uh, um, not travel right now, but groceries, I know dining out is also another one. I think so I actually, even though I have like a lot of different credit cards, I'm only using the ones that are giving me the maximum miles for the, the points, like the, the type of categories I'm spending on. So if it's like, if I have two cards and one's giving me five points, one gives me two points, I'm going to use the five point one. So that's uh, something that's really important. I'm sure Matt will talk all about that on Thursday. Oh, yes, he will. Awesome. Oh, yes, he will. 
So you guys better come. I put the link in the chat somewhere, but it's also just the nomadicnetwork.com slash events. You can find it. Um, okay, we have a few more questions uh, from Colin. How often do you do a big trip, like over two weeks? My travel style, I prefer to travel smaller trips more often than do a big trip. Um, when I'm mapping out my, my year, my uh, travel for the year, I have to make a decision. Am I going to do a big trip and maybe one or two, maybe one little trip, or do I want to do five little trips? Mm -hmm. I'm more of the five little trips person because I want to be out on the road more often. Um, and for me, with my travel fund, the way I talked about it, it's easy for me to limit like, okay, this trip, I only have this budget. And it's like, okay, I have this budget. I move on with it. Um, I would say not often. I, I would think in the past six years, I maybe did like a trip to Europe, like two weeks, like one time. Um, I went to China last year, uh, 10 days. That was last year. Uh, but again, I did that because I knew that was the trip of the year and everything else, there's not that much left to play with. So you have to decide big trip, little trips, or mm -hmm. you could do. Ooh. She'll be back. What, what was that last sentence? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks. What was that last sentence? No, I think, I think I'm uh, okay. You're good. Uh, oh, I said, you have to, you have to decide which trips you want. So if you want to do a big trip or you want to do multiple little trips, you have to kind of make a decision which one you're going to go for, for the year. Very cool. And then, uh, we also had a question. Do you use any particular app to budget like mint or something else? So I prefer budgeting using my own homegrown Excel spreadsheet. Aww. It's just easier for me to manage that way. And to be honest, I'm at the point where I usually just now look at the, I have a bill tracker. I made my own bill tracker and I just look at my bills. I just, that's, I zero in on my bills more than anything nowadays. So uh, you have to also try it out. Like I knew Mint and stuff like that wasn't gonna work for me, but I have a spreadsheet that I really like. So I use that. That's awesome. Also, I wanted to, I wrote this as a note uh, for anyone that's working a full time job. If you've ever heard of the book Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, it's, it's not about full time jobs, obviously, but there is one chapter in there that is super good at how to negotiate remote work. So if you have a full time job that you like and you don't want to stop and make a drop shipping business, he literally has like you know, the conversations written out that you have with your boss and like what steps to take to get a, uh, at least some days remote so that you can do this and, you know, utilize Danielle's tools so that you could go on a Wednesday and, you know, work on Thursday and Friday and get all these great deals and everything. Um, all right, that was amazing, Danielle. I think we got through all the questions too. I like, what wasn't a question were a lot of compliments on how well you did and how passionate you were and what a great speaker and how motivating you are so you can save the chat and read those later <laughs> oh, thank you i so appreciate it that is fantastic news i think my last word of advice for you is if you're not digging into your numbers right now just dig in and see just see what's going on and then from there, you can decide if it's one thing that you're going to take away, just do one thing today um, and take action. I think that's really, really important. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's going to be fine. Um, and also now is a good time to plan for those future trips. Mm -hmm. Like even like we're all staying home for the most part. So now is the time to get all our coins and secure the bags and just go and save it so that when we can, we have the funds that we need, you know, to go off and do amazing things. So yes. Yes. the hour went by so fast. Deb. It did. She also, said, she's it's like, oh my God, the hour went by so fast. Yeah. Well, if you want more hours with Danielle, she has a podcast, The Thought Card. So you can just like go on and spend all your hours with Danielle. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yasina's asking just one more question. Uh, she's asking, you mentioned you have a blog and a podcast and a full-time job. How do you balance this, all of this with also traveling on the weekends? <laughs> I try to do, I try to do one thing a week. So I have one deliverable. Is, is it a podcast episode out? Is it a blog post out? Just one thing. I can't, I can't compete with everyone else, but I can just do one thing and keep myself accountable. And that's how I just publish one piece of content a week. 
So that keeps me afloat. And where can people find your podcast? Yes. So you can head over to podcast.thoughtcard.com. That is my official website for my podcast. If you have a podcast player app, that's your favorite. You could just head over to that app and just type in the thought card there. That's a podcast. We have about 55 episodes there. So you'll hear from lots of different types of travelers and money nerds. So that's a great place to get content. Um, and yeah, my blog is thoughtcard.com. I am at the thought card on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you love this conversation, I have a brand new book called Traveling with a Full-Time Job. That is, uh, you can pre-order that today, um, which is going to be set to release in September, September 5th, which is awesome. I also have a book called Affording Travel, Saving Strategies for Financial Savvy Travelers. So if you want to think more about the budgeting piece for travel, I have a book for that as well. So it was so fun being here. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Erica. This was amazing. Yeah. Thank yes. you so much, Danielle. I really like, I feel like this is the perfect thing for our community to hear right now, just because we cannot travel. So why not just up our travel skills for when we can, and we can grow our bank accounts, grow our points accounts. This is like what we're trying to do, give you guys very useful information. So you're not just sitting at home saying, woe is me, but you're actually like, you know, going forward to your travel uh, dreams. And so I just wanted to put this up again. You know, you can feel free to just take a picture if you want to head over and see about pre-ordering this book. I love that you have a book for everything. I feel like Danielle, uh, <laughs> I've got a book for that. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, show you where to find our other events, just in case this is your first time, the nomadicnetwork.com slash events. Uh, we have a few really cool ones coming up. Um, obviously, Thursday is Nomadic Mat Travel Hacking. Thursday night, because Rick lives in Thailand, so he's doing it at 9 o'clock at night, he's doing a second rendition of the counting countries, exactly how many countries are there. And I just want to say that this is an insanely incredible, like your mind will be spinning and swirling. There's so many more countries than you think. It's unreal. And he tells you about all these very strange ones that you've never heard of. And it's very interesting and he's obsessed with it. And it's so mind boggling. So if you can come, come to that. Also, uh, next Tuesday, we have Talik coming on and talking about Cuba. And then we had a really huge um, talk on moving to France. And so Steven's coming back. Uh, we had that last week. He's coming back next week to just like finish that up. We also have Ava, who's on the call today. She's going to be doing one on teaching English and what it's like to be in South Korea, which for anyone that has student debt, <laughs> this is a great place to go to pay it off while you make money and have an adventure. So come to her uh, presentation. And then we just have this is really cool. So these are all free. You don't ever have to pay for anything. But if you have the means and you'd like to support us, you know, these do uh, take time, effort, and money to put on. And we love having them for you. But if you could, we would love uh, anything like a one-time donation you could give us with PayPal, or you could become a part of our exclusive community, get the replays, get like never been told stories by Nomadic Matt, never been seen photo or photos. And you could just, there's a whole lot of things you get with the Patreon community. It's really cool. I hadn't heard of Patreon before Matt made this and I just love it. Who's heard of Patreon before? Like before Nomadic Matt, yeah? Yeah, so many people are using it. Now I see it everywhere. Anyway, it would be amazing if you could be a part of that. Um, and you can also find that on all the invitations. And then just thank you so much for being a part of our community. See you next time. Danielle, thank you so much. And thank you community for showing up. Honestly, it would be so much less fun if it were just Danielle and I chit-chatting about budgeting. <laughs> We love having you here and I love how many people put their put their videos on today so that we could see your faces and see your reactions and see your like yes or no or you know it's so much fun so thank yes. you for being here and have a great night and thank you so much Danielle. Thank you everyone see you guys soon be well <laughs> stay safe bye 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 bye. Mm -hmm.